I was born May 26, 1921, in McKaysville, Georgia. I was first in the uh, Army Air Corps, but, uh, you know, later on, the, the Air Corps become a unit of its own, just as the Army was, so I was in the Air Force then. That was just a trade, change of records and so on. It didn't affect us at all. I was drafted. I went when they told me and come home when they'd let me. I was drafted in the Army out in Fort Mac. I was in that area up there anyhow. I was working at the maintenance man for the Tennessee Copper Company at uh, Copper Hill, Tennessee. But I do remember the conversation that went on when out in the community and around when it did happen. And of course that was that, well, we we're going to be in war now. And that was the right guess. It had the exam and uh, I guess that's what they based it on. The Air Force was trying to uh, get started then. And I forget the commanding officer of the Air Force, uh, his theory of it, and I think he's right, that I forget just how he put it, but uh, you could never become a mechanic by reading books. You had to do it. You had to get the feel of it, the touch of the bolt and all. And I think he was right in that. It was just the, I, I guess probably the upper class of the mining village. Since my grandfather was the chief mogul, the biggest part of it was based on uh, the copper mining there, and it was just the kind of the rough and tumble uh, uh, mining community. You know, about the most of the miners were of the, of the uh, rough class. That is, they they got drunk every Saturday night fought all day Sunday. I was married and uh, I think I was 21 or 22 years old when I was married. My wife was about three years younger than me, which was Susie's mother. Great mother too, fighting like the devil. That's the only way to fight a, a battle of any kind is to fight it to win. You don't fight at all if you're not going to put forth the effort it takes to win. Don't get involved. And down in Miami, Florida, I was just a guard once in a while and laid on the beach the rest of the time. I thought the war wasn't bad at all. The first official duty, I guess you would call it, I had in the Army was pulling guard duty one night on uh, Miami Beach. And that was back when the uh, the Germans was playing the heck with our East Coast shipping lane. And uh, as I found out later on, the sergeant of the guard was the one that was placing us. And I got the duty of uh, walking guard duty over on the beach, and when they fitted us out to go for guard duty, my weapon was a, felt like a broom handle, it was a wooden stick, anyhow. And I looked at that, I was expecting some kind of a fancy gun or something. Here I had a stick, I asked the sergeant of the guard, I said, now if I see somebody wading up out of the beach, or onto the beach, what am I supposed to do, point this stick at him and holler, bang? <laughs> the only answer I got from that sergeant of the guard was, oh, hell, and he turned around and walked off. <laughs> so that was my first official duty with the Army. It was the Army Air Force then. My final duty was, uh, I was with a group of guys that were working on and checking Every nut and bolt and everything on the Anola Gate to make the trip with the A-bomb. The two trips, rather. 
I was in the States about uh, about a oh, year and a half, two years, about half of my time, four years was uh, about half of that was in, in the States with the uh, Air Force Training Command. When they found out that I had been working as a maintenance man, the Air Force jumped all over me right quick with their school. So I, I didn't know how to put a nut on a bolt and a few things. And the average uh, soldier didn't know. Like my first group, I have a little picture of some of them. Uh, they didn't. You uh, start talking to them about a bolt or a nut, and they didn't even know what it was. Or a screw. What's the difference between a screw and a, and a bolt? And things like that that you you need to know. That's where I. Commanding officers said you couldn't uh, you couldn't learn what the difference by reading the book to where you could do it. You could use them in uh, production. The troop trains, the farther west and the farther north you got, the better you was treated on a troop train. I'm sad to say, but uh, the uh, average southerner. Just wasn't as good to us GIs as uh, the others, and they uh, reason that they was given to us was that there'd been too many army bases around over the south that they were the, the southern lady was always accustomed to the soldiers, so we wasn't anything new. You get up uh, old Kentucky on up. It wasn't any. They'd never seen soldiers before. Or you get going out west. If you didn't get down in the Texas area, they they didn't know anything about a, a soldier, how he lived, or what he, how he thought, or anything. The ladies, uh, if they could get the troop train to stop, they'd feed us. They'd bring the sandwiches and uh, the best cheese. Oh boy, that. Uh, that German village cheese was out of this world, and that bread, I don't know how they cooked it. Somebody should go and try to get it, but it'd have a big, thick, tender crust on it. Golly, of course, we was hungry anyhow. That makes it taste better, you know. But uh, they, they were good to us. You don't forget it quick either. First one was... Uh, uh, Goldsboro, North Carolina, Seymour Johnson, uh, our base. And the next one was uh, Chinook Field, Illinois. That's up about uh, 100 miles north of Chicago. And let's see, from there I went to, uh, where did it go to from there? I forget now. But then the next place was uh, Grand Island, Nebraska coldest place this side of the North Pole. And then from there to uh, started hitting the little old islands over went overseas from Grand Island. Never forget, forget there's uh, orders come through that one of the guys that had been a bunch a long time was being shipped out and the rest of us wasn't. And we were having a going away party for him. And during the party, somebody come in from the base, said, lo and behold, orders had come through. It wasn't just shipping to him, it was entering us all. And then it did turn into a wild party. That's the only time in my life that I was ever drunk. And I'll never forget how sick I was. When we went home, I was uh, I was married and had the wife was with me. And I'd start from the bathroom, from heaving to to the bed, and I couldn't make it. I'd have to turn around and run back to the bathroom and heave some more. I'll, I'll never forget she got the garbage can and held it under me till I got in the bed. We were over in the Pacific, and I don't remember them. It's just so many little old islands. I don't remember the name. I remember the name of, of one is about halfway between uh, 
the other islands over in the Pacific and Honolulu. It's about a thousand miles west of Honolulu. And uh, they had trouble with planes flying that far without refueling. So there was a coral reef over there, Kwajalein. They dredged it out big enough and made a runway. It was just about the size of the, the island, or just about the size of an aircraft carrier. And you, you went in there for fuel, and as, as you went in, you thought the first thing you thought was, well, by golly, he's going to land in the ocean this time because the water, you could almost reach out and dip your finger in it. And uh, you, uh, you went in, and there was a sign that was almost as big as the end of this building, some energetic GI, I guess, had painted it as... Uh, I forget a whole lot of it on it, but one thing right across the top of it, you're now entering Quadrillain Atoll. I reckon Atoll is for an island. But anyhow, that sign, you're now entering Atoll, Quadrillain Atoll. No fun at all. No girls at all. No beer at all. Let's see. No fresh food at all. There's a big bunch of it. And the last one that across the, the bottom of it. Uh, any, anyone that likes this damn place don't have any sense at all. <laughs> I remember that more than any island I was on. I was an electrician on a B-29. And they told us, and I guess it's right, the wires, and it was little bitty wires running in a conduit, a thin wall conduit made of aluminum, I guess, a light material, anyhow. And uh, they told us that there was as much wire in one B-29 as there was in the average 1,400 population village. Over in the Pacific, some some island, and I just forget which one. We was on more than one, and of course at that time he wasn't caring what the name was, no way. But he was a son of one of my hunting friends up in the little village of Mineral Bluff, Georgia. And that J.D. was the only guy in all my Army experience that I ever met that was from my home community, and he was a cook. And that was about the luckiest find I ever had because I, if there's anything good come in to eat, I got some of it. One of the things I remember that we got was a canned chicken. They just selected them for size and roasted them, and they just fit down in a gallon metal can and sealed up. Same kind of can that you see other thing, food stuff put in. That and uh, we got a fresh cheese in one of them. That was the two best things there was. And I got my part of it because when it come on, me and JD would come and get me and we'd have a feast. I was moving closer to uh, Japan. They ever moved was getting closer because when it started, we didn't have anything that the, the uh, Biggest loss was due to running out of fuel or some mine or something. And you wondered why in the heck there's that much such a devil of a fight over it and what it was. The reason is getting a, a base up there to work for a plane or running out of fuel or mechanical problem or anything. They could land there when before they were just lost at, at sea, that's all. I think it's more or less a... a a uh, 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 volcano made island. The, the uh, you know the uh, picture that showed up so much with the uh, GIs uh, putting up the American flag on top of the mountain. Guam was uh, one of the bigger islands. It was spoke of as the paradise of the Pacific. If that was the paradise, I sure would hate to get in the hell of it. The Pacific, but uh, it was. Uh, 
a fairly good sized island. You know, there those Pacific Islands, none of them that I was on was any size, a mile or two square, something like that. And I often wondered how in the world anybody would be born, reared, and die with old age and never get no further than that away from home. And we had the great <laughs> lady that's in the same profession, by golly, that you people are in with, broadcast Tokyo Rose. I'll never forget old Tokyo. When Tokyo come on, everything come to a screeching halt right quick because you could get you get Tokyo on the uh, radios and the or B twenty nines, and everybody would make a dive for one of them to listen at Tokyo Rose cuss us, boy. We we were known with the Japanese and Tokyo Rose is all we'd get out from is. <laughs> Them son of bitches on Guam. Boy, they hated us because by the time they were there, the Americans had developed the B-29 some winter to where it was a high-flying booger. They bombed from about 70,000 feet. That's a long ways up, you know. And uh, as quick as the boys got back from the raid, we'd all assemble up in the day room or tent and uh, see the movies of it. They had to make movies of all of it. And you could see that at 70,000 feet, you could see the uh, object drop out of the bottom. You couldn't tell what it was. It was just a blimp like. And go down and down and down. <laughs> and finally it had hit, and you could see shrapnel flying every place. And the Japanese didn't have anything they could anywhere near get up there. They couldn't, they couldn't bother us. So it's just as we spoke of it as a milk run. The old Tokyo didn't like us, boy. One of the remaining things, oh, the guy that I tell you about from Astoria, Oregon, Matello was his name. He come to me, this boy, well, Tokyo Rose was the best morale builder, I think, that they had to hate for more Tokyo. And she's always broadcasting you, some bitches on Guam. They hated us because that's the headquarters and so on for the Pacific operation. And this is where when his father was uh, on the fishing boat out of Astoria, Oregon, and he worked on it. So as a result of that, he was known as Mate. And old Mate, when he was on a furlough before he went overseas, got married. And Tokyo Rose had come on overnight, just about the time we was going to bed, and everybody had turned on the radio. And she'd get on us, son of bitches from Guam. And uh, let's see how did she put it. Anyhow, is uh, what, it, <laughs> what are you getting tonight? What do you suppose your SOB's <laughs> uh, wife is getting from the, the four F's? All of that kind of conversation. That old mate, you just, all you had to do is ask, ask him, you reckon that's true? And boy, he'd go into a rage. You'd never seen anybody as mad in your life. He'd have jumped Tokyo Rose's eyes out with his fingers if he could have got to her. She was spreading propaganda, yeah, but it was, it, it was, uh, it wasn't getting the effects you thought it would because. The GI had turned it into a joke, you know. Like, uh, oh, Matilla, for example, you pass by him. Hey, where, where, wonder where Tokyo says your wife's going tonight. And boy, that's all, that's all you had to say. He, he, he hit another cussing rage. Yeah. She was boosting morale because that, that had become a joke to us then, you know. We wasn't worried about what her wife was doing. I know I wasn't. Somebody had didn't have to tell us. We could see it how mean they were to those islanders and the the little children on the island. That's the thing they got those close to us quicker than anything else. There's one thing that I appreciate about a American soldier. I never saw one that wasn't good to a child. I don't know whether it was because he was afraid the other GI would get him or what, but. Every one of them, if he had a candy bar, he'd give it to a kid and go hungry himself.
C rations and K rations. They were, uh, they looked more like a railroad spike than anything. They were chocolate bars or had been chocolate, but they're so old that they're more cream colored than uh, chocolate colored. We tamed them down with them old C rations, K rations, chocolate <laughs> sticks. And pretty soon after we went in, this one particular island uh, had a PX type thing. You could buy new, new chocolate like Milky Way and Babe Ruth and all of those famous ones. And you uh, ask them little boogers, you want a candy bar? <laughs> His first thing was, what kind is it? If it wasn't the kind he liked, he didn't want it. When we first went there, he liked it all. He got picky. One thing that made the American soldier dislike a, a Jap more than even than uh, the, what was 7-Eleven? Dropping a bomb in our own city. I think that being mean to children made us hate them more than that. They'd beat those little old kids, little old kids like that. Scars on their back where them darn Japs had whipped them. And that's one thing about an American soldier. I never saw one that wasn't good to a child. I don't know whether there's... I'm sure there's some that wouldn't have been, but they was probably afraid of the other G.I. would pick him off the first time he got him out in the rifle range or someplace. The eating habits was altogether different. Their, their diet was mostly based on seafood, fish, and shrimp, and things of that nature, which is not the case with us. But that was the biggest thing we noticed was their, of course, the GI is always looking for something to eat. That's, that is just part of life, is hunting you something to eat. My friend from home was a, the cook for us, and anything that come in that is good, I got my portion of it because he'd come get me and we'd have a party. And the best thing was, the two things was this canned chicken I was telling you about. It uh, had been picked the size to fit a gallon metal container, sealed of course, and also a, a soft, fresh cheese. That was the two best things I think we had to eat. They were both good. The Army, our force, had a, a ruling that if when the plane made a mission or anything, when it hit the ground, you never quit working on it, regardless of what was wrong with it, till it was ready to fly again. If it took a day, so it would be good. If it took two days, hardly so good. If it took a week, it's as bad. And you'd be surprised if I tell you there's a lot of things that happened to them, and I don't remember exactly what they were now, that, but it'd take uh, close to a week, if they, especially if the wiring had got shot up or anything. It was, it was a job replacing it. One man couldn't work on it. It went the, the little teeny wires went through a conduit made of aluminum, I guess, or some light metal. And if that thing got shot into or broke or anything, you had a wad of them little wires. The little wires run to a a motor or something, and then the motor was activated and it. Uh, run on the higher, on the 24 volt. And uh, it uh, just took a long, long time to sort them wires out. You had to have two men. They were color-coded, and I was about half colorblind, which made it rough for me. But you'd have a man on one end and you on the other end, and you would make a wire hot, that is, you touch it, you know, to the battery or something, and the guy on the other end would check it, and the one that had come out over there, oh, that was the one. If it didn't come out, you know, this is shot in two someplace or broke someplace. 
and it's quite a job. They told us, I don't know whether right or wrong, that they, in a B-29 there was about as many feet of electrical wiring as there was in a, a village of 1,400 here in the States. That's a whole lot of wires to put in, back through the bomb bay is in a, oh, I guess an inch and a half conduit, and it is no room to spare. But you worked on anything there was to work on till everything was ship shape again. But if that's done, well then you drop back and you worked on your own plane on it. Of course, you had already gone over it, so there wasn't anything to do but sit around and wait for it to make another mission. And by the way, one night, late afternoon, I was with the 300 and either 315th or 316th bomb wing, and I forget which. And the reason I forget is we was on one end of the landing strip and the other was on the other. There's 315th and 316th was, uh, and as part of the same crew, I knew a lot of the guys had been with them before. But, uh, I don't know, you, you, you worked till you got them ready to go. I'd better start to tell you. One afternoon I saw 120 B-29s take off in one minute intervals. Boy, they just about shake the islands out there, warming up and getting ready to go on them. They're getting a little here ready to go on them is ready to go. But you take a hundred and, well, they wouldn't have all the whole hundred and twenty because it took, a, oh, an hour and a half, I guess, maybe two hours for them to take off in one minute intervals. That was just kind of a joke among us GIs. In the event of our, our raid, don't go to the banks or into the jungles, well, they'll, they'll hit you if you do that, but... If you go in, uh, go under a B-29, you're safe because the American Air Force thought more of the B-29 than they did of the crew that worked on it. They get another crew a whole lot easier than they could get a, another uh, B-29. And by the way, we got a lot of B-29s that was made up here, assembled up here at Marietta. And we didn't like them a bit because they just come about halfway assembled. There's boxes full of things to put on them after we got them. And we was doing it under combat conditions. And them Marietans is working on them. They had a good good building, but we didn't have any building. We had to work out in that hot sun. And boy, did it ever get hot back in that Bombay. I was an electrician, as everybody says. There's on, uh, they worked on anything. They was working on something to getting it ready. The Enola Gay, to my knowledge, was never hit or anything, but it it really got the going over before it made another mission. That's for sure, because, you know, it had a pretty good-sized payload on it. Our commanding officer cut us down on the runway some short time before the A-bomb was dropped. Wanted to tell us some things. Some of us, some of them he could tell, and some of them he couldn't, and some of them he knew, and some of them he didn't. But there was something big was going to happen soon. And if that didn't drop or knock the Japs out of the war, they would be invaded October the 18th. Yeah, October the 18th. That wasn't too far off either. I forget when the A bomb was dropped, but it, it wasn't years. That was from one day to the other. I was on <coughs> guard duty one night. They had a rule that somebody on the crew had to stay with the plane all the time. And there was a nine-man ground crew. from A nine-man crew on one, and it just happened that particular night I'm talking about was uh, my night. And our plane was parked right at the end of the runway you went so, like from here, I guess, here to the highway out there, 
that hit the cliffs or Guam or well, most all those islands are up a hundred foot or so, the steep, and then it level off. But anyhow, that's the way that one, Guam, was. And uh, the Japanese still control the cliffs and all of that. And this particular night I'm talking about is my night for guard duty, and I was on guard duty back at the edge of the jungle. And uh, from my experience as a kid in the, up in the Smoky Mountains, I had studied nature, I don't know why, but because the, the Indians, I guess, but I had a very simple thing that if wildlife was all going this direction, something over here that was disturbing it. And that uh, there was also something, I don't know whether there's a monkey or a bird, what it was, but when they were disturbed at night, they made the darndest noise. They sounded like a bunch of crows that had found a dead dog along the highway or and only it was a whole lot stronger and louder than a crow. And I heard him start hollering back over in the jungle where in the cliffs where the Japs at, well I knew this some activity over there that's disturbing them. And that started getting closer and closer. <laughs> Every time it got closer I got scareder. That is uh, was one of our <laughs> says that uh, a guy that said he wasn't scared was in one or two classes. He's either a damned idiot or a damn liar, one or the other, if he, wasn't, if he never got scared. But I, I was scared. And they kept getting closer. They got close enough to me that uh, I could hear them walking in the jungles and hearing them jabbering and talking. And I was laying right flat on the ground. Boy, I was laying flat, too, and studying about what I was going to do. And I was thinking, I knew how they told us the Japs was treating the American prisoners. And uh, laying there with them coming, I made up my mind, yeah, you're not going to take me prisoner. I'll shoot as long as I can shoot, and they'll, they'll do me in, and that'll be the end of it for me. Well, they come up, like I said, close enough so I could hear them walking in the leaves and breaking sticks. And for some reason, they stopped and had some kind of a meeting or something. Never heard such jabbering in your life. I guess it sounded louder to me than it was. But anyhow, they stomped around out there. Seemed like eternity, but that again was uh, time was passing slow. All of a sudden... They turned and went back where they come. They never, if they'd if they'd gone as much farther as the length of this building, they'd been on top of me. That's the nearest I ever come of being uh, in trouble. It was night time, and of course a rifle gives off a, you know, a, a, the powder explosion is a end of the barrel. Not only does the bullet come out, but a streak of fire comes out. And they would have spotted me right quick shooting, and every one of them would have shot at me. Some of them would have hit me. And I didn't aim for them to take me prisoner. Them damn Japs wasn't going to beat up on me. I'd, I'd just do it in and have it over with. You had one or two choices. You could surrender, or you could fight as long as you was able to fight till they done you in, and that is it. You had to. You, you didn't have. A, you didn't have a whole bunch of choices, and the way they hated us soldiers, Guam soldiers, boy, they they would have gave us a hard way to go if they captured any of us because that was that was where all of the bad stuff was coming from, either Guam or Guam was kind of headquarters for the uh, B twenty nine outfits where they get together. Paradise of the Pacific, the name it had. The thing we were looking forward to is the war being over. Then we could come home. What happened to them on European theaters? Wasn't much concern to us. War was over for me when the A-bombs was dropped. Our commanding officer got us all together down on the runway. That's where we had meetings. And told us that uh, it's a known fact that idle soldiers got into trouble. 
and what he was going to offer to us, we could hunt us up a job ourselves, or he'd hunt up a job for us. We wasn't going to be idle, getting into trouble. I mean, in trouble was getting drunk and fighting and playing poker and so on. And uh, about three or four of us, we decided we'd go to work down on the beach. That's the best place to work cleaning up rubbish down there. It had washed ashore, so that's, that was our job. The day the war was over, we went in and had a squadron runner. That was a boy that worked out of the main office and went out and getting soldiers that the uh, commanding officer wanted to see or any message and so on. When I got up there, he ran up to me, where you been? I said, I've been down on the beach working. Where do you think I've been? Well, he said, you're supposed to be going home. Well, boy, that changed the attitude altogether. I, I first told him, if you're lying to me, I'm going to kill you. He wasn't lying to me. You go on over to supply and see if I'm lying to you. And I did, and he wasn't lying to me. I knew the supply sergeant. He got my records all out and looked at my eyes. He said, Everything you had was lost in combat and just tore it up and throw it over and said, I'll get you a jeep to take you down to the Air Force. We'll catch up with your time. There's the Air Base. I went down there and there's, I guess, 18 or 20, maybe 25 GIs is down there, just like I was. But uh, we didn't have, our priority would allow us to fly on a plane, but we asked for it when we flew and all that, when you can, that's all. So them GIs, they'd, some of them had been there a week and on just waiting on to catch something out. There's a pretty long line. <coughs> and as GIs would, when I joined them, they started razzing me that, shoot, uh, I'd be dead for it with old age before I got over there. Look how many there is of us in front of you and all of that stuff, you know like GIs will do. Well, when they hadn't been there but a little while, so they called a roll on the ones that could catch the next plane. And it's the only time I ever saw it happen. <laughs> but it's, it's the actual truth. It happened. They started at the long end of the line, and I was number one <laughs> back there. And boy, I, I, got, I got revenge with them guys come on to Honolulu and had to lay over there. And there three or four days and they got a flight and come in. I done a little bit of the razz and if they never get home, they just better start learning to swim and so on. But it's a, it's a great old world, I'll tell you. I think us guys of my age, I was about the average age of the uh, American World War II soldier. I wouldn't. I don't believe I'd have missed it more than a few months. Or so there's one, one period of time that I kind of took it on myself to survey and see where I fit as far as the age group. Now there was a there was a time, you know, that they released. That was over. I believe it was over 38. I forget what it was, but we had some olders up to then. I had brother living in Atlanta at that time. And she come down to my brother's, and uh, I uh, met up with a GI from Marietta. And we, we were talking, he was asking questions, and so was I. And he had, he had a car, his family had a car that was available to him. He was going to go back and forth to, to the base till he got uh, discharged. And... Uh, when I told him where I was staying, oh, he said, that's all my route, you ride with me. So I had a good, I had a, a good taxi for three or four days that I was there trying to get discharged. No, it's longer than that, I guess it's a week. I come back and uh, I, well, I was pretty well tired of being tied to something, you know, I. I hadn't been through high school long, and that was pretty confining. And then uh, when I was through a couple of years, uh, I was working, 
getting ready to go back to college. And I, we decided to shoot that. I'd been tied down long enough, so I rambled a little bit. My brother-in-law and uh, two other guys. I had a car. We decided we'd go up north, up in the automobile world, get us a job. And we went up there. <laughs> we went to Akron, Ohio, where the rubber plant is where we planned to go. We got up there, and I had the old Chevrolet, and I'd put before I went in the army. I'd put a a straight exhaust on it, made out of some kind of steel. And boy, you talk about something. Sounding off, it had sound off. And in Akron, we didn't even get in town good. The police pulled me over and said, uh, if, you'll, uh, if you'll leave town before dark, I won't bother you. And I said, that's the deal. So we didn't stop in Akron. We went on up to a little town up in north, extreme northern Ohio, Fremont, Ohio. On a weekend, so we decided we'd spend the weekend there. And while we was there, we met some guys, and they told us that there was a Clyde Porcelain Steel was hired to go out there and get us a job. They paid good. Monday morning, we went out there, and we did. All of us went to work. Did you ever go back to college? Well, I worked a year or two, and was just doing the same thing at the end of the time that I was at the beginning. And my wife and I had always, uh, we done everything as we, it wasn't I, as we. We could sit down and talk it over, it wasn't making any progress that way. I'd just go back to school, so come back to Georgia and enrolled at uh, Young Harris College, junior college up in the mountains. And by the way, one of my best friends while I was in college was Zell Miller. Zell was a big old long-legged boy, and there wasn't but just three or four veterans there when I, I was there as a small school. And you could tell old Zell any kind of a war story you wanted to, and he'd believe it. And that's kind of a joke with us, of telling Zell all about the war. Later on, Zell wasn't so much of a joke, I guess. It just affected, uh, well, I guess all of my life. After the after the war, because I rambled around a little bit for a job and decided we wasn't making any progress. I just quit and go back to school. I went back to school on the GI Bill, and <laughs> I had made the uh, more money than the average when I was working up in Ohio. I was making from 100 to $150 a week when a good paying job back then was uh, 40 or $50 a week. I was a big guy. The big guy always got the hard job, but that did there, but they paid you for it too. I've talked to several groups such as this one. Uh, I'm out at Oxford College, they was having some kind of a course, I don't know exactly what it was, and some way the kids found out about me, and they, they, it's three or four of them coming out at different times, interviewed me about what happened, what happened. I would try to teach them what actually happened, and the truth, and nothing but the truth, and the whole truth, and let them make up their own mind from their own. Uh, I would try to teach them something about it because uh, about all the World War II veteran knew about the World War I veteran was that there was such an animal, and that's all that is it. And he didn't know what he'd done, where he'd done it, or anything about it. You know, they never, uh, these older guys, and here's us older guys, put it that way, it's that you older guy. Uh, well, we just we wasn't taught anything about the World War One, or I wasn't, and apparently that was the grade. And the uh, our country lost a big defense item when the country boys ceased to exist. You know, there's very few boys reared in the country now. 
when I was a boy, about everybody was. And uh, we'd worked on the old junk tractor and so on, but we, we could work on a tank or an airplane or anything. We did we knew how it worked. We did, did and we could uh, was pretty good at fixing it too. We could be, could improvise. We'd been in a habit if you was over on the back forty at eleven o'clock of a day and your old tractor clunked out on you, you'd figure out some way to get it to run enough so you could ride it to the house and wouldn't have to walk a trip or two. And when you got after lunch, you'd you'd go to work on that thing, fix it, and go back to work again. They don't do that anymore. These boys I had from the Boston area, they was a, a good percent of them. I bet they'd have never done as much as even change a flat tire. A country boy gets his training by necessity and experience. This uh, commanding officer of the uh, training command, and I'm sorry, but I forget his name, uh, and one of his things was that you uh, you can't you can I forget just how he put it but anyhow you could you could read a stack of books a, a mile high or some ridiculous figure like that but you still uh, you couldn't learn how to put the nut on the bolt by reading you had to do it by experience and get the feel of it.